You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. Pat Foreman, you're the author of City Chicks, Chicken Tractors, The Permaculture Guide to Happy Hens and Healthy Soil, and Backyard Market Gardening. And I I finished um, City Chicks. I'm in the middle of Chicken Tractors, and I really am loving your books. And I wanted to start our interview today with maybe sharing a couple of little known facts about chickens that the listeners may not know about because this whole next 45 minutes or so is going to be all about chickens. You love and admire chickens so much. What are three things about them that you really, really want to share with people? One of the things I I really adore about them is their charm. I, I, I hadn't realized until I moved the coop really up close to my house and my, my coop is literally uh, 30 feet from my office window and from, from my home, because as I was writing City Chicks, I realized if I had to have, uh, uh, people are going to say, oh, you, they're, they're smelly, they're this and they're, they're that. And even though I'd raised thousands of, of uh, chickens before, they were always out on, 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 the, on, the, on the pasture or in the, uh, uh, in the barn. So it wasn't until I brought that coop up by the house and I could look out my window and really watch them. I felt like Margaret Mead, kind of of the uh, Gallus uh, Domestica <laughs> this version. <laughs> and I'd, I'd spend hours just watching. And the charm of chickens came out. And it wasn't until I got up close and personal that, that I really realized that there, how much personality and um, intelligence and, and just uh, abilities that they do have. So that's the first one is, is their charm. I think the second one is their skill sets because chickens truly have a resume that will knock your socks off for permaculture. I mean, they can pretty much serve as a lot of the um, chemical, synthetic chemical inputs that we plant enhancement products that we have. Chickens can do a lot of that, of course, but it's on a micro scale. They're not going to do that on a monoculture, but they can really be insecticiders, herbiciders, um, fertilizers, and topsoil creators in your backyard. So that's the second thing is, is their skill sets. And their skill sets, it includes more than just those things. They also can be um, companions. They can be uh, – they have an incredible entertainment skills. I mean, they've got uh, – they're, they're, they're just wonderful workers, and they're very willing and constant workers. And I guess the third thing – that is so important and why I originally got involved with chickens uh, with Andy Lee, by the way, he's the co-author. We're, we're co-authors of uh, Chicken Tractor and Backyard Market Gardening and, and Day Range Poultry and A Tiny Home to Call Your Own. Um, but the real reason I initially got involved with chickens was a, was to increase soil fertility for a community farm that was just getting started on a sandy floodplain. So... Um, we, we, that's when we built the very first chicken tractor, and we'd read about chicken tractors from, from – uh, gosh, I forget where we first heard about it. It probably was in the permaculture manual. But we built the first one way overbuilt, two by fours. I mean, it was, took three, person, three people to move it. It was so heavy. And it was specifically to try to get organic matter and fertility into really sandy loam soils, enough so that it could support a community farm. So my first experience with chickens was not for eggs or for meat or for their charm or anything at all. It was specifically to enrich and fertilize and enhance the uh, humus in uh, topsoil. And that is an amazing fact that I, I didn't know that about chickens. And I, I after reading your books, I realized I really didn't know that much about chickens at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> now I, I feel like I'm learning. Um, you talked a bit about building soil, and I think maybe if you could go into that more in depth and talk about how they till and they compost and they're fertilizer producers and how do they actually build topsoil? 
Well, there are several ways you can employ them to build topsoil. And I've got to say, Jill, uh, I mean, I, and when I do these different workshops across the country, I, I usually, in every every presentation, I say, what are the two most valuable commodities on our planet? W- what are they? Water and it's uh, topsoil. And, and we've lost so much topsoil, almost a third of the entire topsoil in, in the entire world has been lost since, um, since we started modern agriculture. Um, so huge amounts of erosion. So we can't eat gold, we can't eat oil, but, but if, if you, you have topsoil, you, you're going to have a civilization that um, can exist and evolve. If you don't have topsoil, you'll have Collapse, which is a, a wonderful book by Gerald Diamond. Uh, that really turned my interest and my focus on the importance of both both really good water and uh, living topsoils. So chickens, what they can do, well, let me start first by saying there's a product called Cock-a-Doodle-Doo. It's, it's dried chicken manure. Dried chicken manure sells for uh, $15 for 20 pounds. So what you can view with little with, with a family flock, for example, is is these little little guys are out there. Of course, one of their skill sets is they poop this incredibly high nitrogen, uh, incredibly high mineral. About half of it is organic matter uh, um, product <laughs> that sells in cockadoodle do for seventy six cents a pound dried. I mean, you get that free in your backyard, and and you can place them. Then it's, it's the appropriate place at the appropriate time. You can, you can can you can organize that so that you can literally harvest um, fertilizer, fertilizer. And Jill, where does most of our commercial fertilizer come from? I would think from petrochemicals. You are so right. It comes from oil. It comes from oil. Where, where, do, where do most of our pesticides come from? Same place, huh? Oil. And what about some of the herbicides? Not, not all, but a lot of the herbicides. Oil. I mean, so much of our agriculture is based on oil. That I mean, this this has been you know told time and time again that the the amount of um, calories that it takes to get a food product to your plate, put your plate to your table, can be more than you will extract out of it from from your body from when you eat it. So, so if you've got a family flock in your backyard and you look out there and you go, man, they're just as good as little clucking oil wells right there in my backyard. And I'm creating food from that. I mean, chickens are such pets with benefits when it comes to uh, when it comes to the products that they can help us uh, do to create our local foods. And it's really all about sustainable local agriculture, with the emphasis on local agriculture. One thing I really liked was how you keep tying it back to local agriculture, emergency preparedness. Um, they can be partners with emergency preparedness and national defense. Absolutely. You have taken the chicken and tied it into so much that it's so important right now with where we are. Um, could you tell us a bit about the title of City Chicks? And really, is it practical and does it work to have chickens in the city, in urban areas? We, we we chose city chicks because it's cheeky. I mean, you could. It's easy to remember. You know, there's even a, a, a the Dixie Chicks. I mean, it's, it's kind of a popular sort of tongue in cheek. So it's it's uh, it, it's really cheeky. And the other reason, the more depthy reason that I really personally, as the author, wanted to have city chicks as the title, is that Robert Mon- Robert Mon- um, Robert <laughs> Rodale, when he was um, just before he was killed in Russia. Yeah, and of course, Robert Rodell Prevention Magazine and Organic Garden, you know, Rodell Press. He his view was that the farm of the future would be these hyperproductive chinks, and he used the word chinks, chinks of land between development, hyperproductive chinks of land between development. So, so when when we were th- when I was thinking about city chicks, and Robert Rodell is one of my uh, one of my heroes. I mean, I've got his picture here in my office. Um, and I often ponder and, and uh, just wonder what what would what would Bob think <laughs> about this. So so when I read that and I realized that um, there's so much. Well, here's another question for you. Here's another question for you. And this is becoming more and more known. And we need to really understand the impact of this question because it took me about three months and before it really the penny really dropped, and I realized the magnitude of it. But Jill, what's the most the most uh, fertilized, irrigated, largest crop in America. You know, Pat, I wouldn't have known that until I read your book. Ah, 
It is grass. It's fescue. We've got 30 to 40 million acres of grass fescue in America. I mean, it's a huge amount of land. So, so, and all those little chinks of land, it kind of ties right back to, to Bob Rodale. Those, those chinks of land are, are pretty much unproductive right now. They're just being mowed and they're in grass. But it's possible that they could provide food. I mean, during World War II, the Victory Gardens, uh, all the guys were off to war and, and, you know, the women were pretty much back there doing the gardens. The, even during that time, they produced about 40 percent of all, all the nation's produce were from Victory Gardens and they had chickens. They had chickens back then. So all that is getting around to say is what we can have again is is we don't have a lack of land. I don't believe in in my little world that we don't have a lack of land for producing local foods. We have a lack of vision and imagination. And that's where chickens come in because they can enable the use of those and they can make hyperproductive little chinks of land between the development and do it in such a way that it becomes back to an agrarian society while still being urban. So that's that's a pretty big leap of faith, I think, um, and a pretty big leap of even imagination. But I believe it's possible. Mm -hmm. And yeah, your book is very optimistic. And you really do talk about using animals as our partners in this. Well, they have to be. They have to be because in in the past, of course, the the the, the family farms they'd have cows or or they'd have you know <laughs> sheep, goats, whatever it is. But they would have something that would be producing um, organic matter that would then Im- improve the soil. On the Great Plains, we had buffaloes, huge herds of buffaloes, and they would mob graze, and they would manure, and then their little pointy hooves would pound it into the soils. And, and of course, the Great Plains had, had uh, tens, tens of, I mean, a lot of topsoil, some places even 20 feet. Uh, and now, the, the Great Plains, some, some of the wheat and, and uh, other crops are being, I mean, just, there isn't that much topsoil left. So... Um, topsoil is a big key. If civilizations are going to uh, survive and choose to succeed, it'll be because we have good topsoil and clean water and a will to do so. So that, that's why I wanted this, the thing City Chicks is to, to tie it into Robert Rodale's idea of being able to have hyperproductive chinks of land in urban areas, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally, it makes sense. And I, I always think about, um, I did an interview with uh, Robin Francis from mm-hmm. Australia about Cuba. And she was saying how, I think, it, I even believe it was a law there that if you had some land, you were supposed to cultivate it, you know, and grow food mm-hmm. and that empty lots could be cultivated. And I could see that happening eventually here in the States as well. Well, there's a lot of empty lots. In uh, St. Louis, for example, they have the garden, uh, Gateway Gardens, and they've got something like 200 uh, community gardens uh, on empty lots within St. Louis. They don't have chickens yet, but we're, we have some plans to maybe get that through. But if you throw chickens in with them, then you've got your natural fertilizers and uh, – Gosh, they they they'll they'll eat eat the waste uh, garden scraps. Uh, they'll <laughs> provide eggs. I mean, they'll provide meat if you want to go that route. I mean, they they just um, they're just the local enablers. And I really loved in your book too. One thing that you brought up that I didn't really think about was how chickens actually divert waste from landfills, and that they're waste biomass recyclers. Could you tell our listeners about that? Oh, well, I got to tell you, this, this, I think, is the next frontier um, in so many ways, because America right now is, is just trashing so many organic assets and doing it with great abandon. About 50% of all the, the uh, solid waste, municipal solid waste that is collected could be composted. It's biomass that could somehow, one way or another, be composted. Of that, approximately, and it, it changes a little bit, but about 25% of of that 50% comes from households. So if if you could take a quarter of all the solid waste that was collected and sent to landfills or incinerated or whatever whatever you're doing with it, um, wouldn't that be a significant taxpayer savings? Well, well here's the thing about chickens is, is one chicken eats about its weight in food every month. So you take a standard-sized chicken that's about seven to eight pounds. 
Now, a lot of that food doesn't have to come from a bag. It, they, chickens love people food. They're voracious carnivores, and they, they absolutely will eat just about anything. They're omnivores, truly. So a lot of that could be any spoiled food in the refrigerator. It could be garden waste. It could be that piece of pizza that you didn't eat or the – or the um, you know, wh- whatever it is, the, the, you, 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 they'll eat it. Now, the trick is, Jill, there's a real trick to this, and, and I didn't realize that people weren't quite – understanding this before you can't just throw that food out on the ground in the run and expect the chickens to just sort of consume it all and then there won't be any problems what you got to do is have a thick um the six to 12 inch um deep mulch system where the chickens can scratch and really fluff up whatever it is leaves or grass clippings maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a bin compost area but if you put it in that area you dump those food scraps or garden scraps on that that area and they can get in there they will eat some of it they'll eat quite a bit of it but a lot of it they'll cover over and then what they cover over of course those un, uncalculable numbers of uh, fungus and bacteria and and uh, molds that will go go to work breaking it down and then what the other thing that happens, the earthworms will come up and just absolutely pull it right down into into the soil. So if you if you've got family flocks in a uh, community, and you're also doing composting and, and teaching composting, chickens with composting, you can divert I, tons and tons of of uh, biomass from the uh, solid waste management system. And build your soil at the same time. Well, that's a side benefit. I mean, really, the, in, in Europe, they're using this. They've, they've used this for years as a strategy of part of their, their waste management system. Uh, one example is uh, Diest. It's a city of Diest in uh, Belgium, Flanders. And what they do is, is they buy chickens. They buy laying hens to give to any resident who wants them. And and they also te- use composting, but they they give them chickens, and it's not for the eggs or the meat or for build topsoil or anything sort of similar to that. It is specifically to keep kitchen scraps and yard waste out of the landfill system. And the beautiful thing about chickens, of course, is is because of their manure is so high nitrogen, you can take that manure and you can mix it in with your leaf and your your yard your grass clippings and your garden. Res- residues, whatever it is, you, you've got that ma- the manure is like a one, and if you've got the browns or the fifty, you mix those two together, and you've got the recipe for compost. So they really bring that missing ingredients of that high nitrogen into the composting project. So it's it's to me it's such a no brainer, but it's it's kind of this this idea that oh gosh, if we do composting in urban areas or in the inner cities, there'll be smells and flies and disgusting, but. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can manage it such that there's no odor at all, and you can literally um, create raised beds or, or uh, uh, compost piles, and, and it's it's totally natural. So it's it's not possible, Jill, for us to necessarily have buffalo in our backyard, right? <laughs> I mean, no, no, we, we can't use them to give us that, that nitrogen fix of that big hunk, but we can do it with – it's going to be small little ways, like millions of little little chickens pooping and mixing that in with the local local um, backyard waste, such that that waste does not even have to leave the property. It never has to be picked up by the city or the, or the municipality, and that can divert tons and tons and tons of organic matter out of landfills, or even being having to pick up and transferred and pay tipping fees. And it can create topsoil to grow our food in. I mean, it, it's so simple, and yet it's so powerful. Thomas Jefferson saw America as an agrarian type of society with, with these small little farms. And, and he, he even had uh, tractors, animal tractors, in his in his writings and on his farm. So this is not a new idea. It's not something I came up with. It, it's, it's just kind of old-time common sense about how to grow healthy food in living soils and using animals to do it. And chickens, chickens, chickens are the unit of use, easy, convenient way to do it because they're so small and so manageable. It is. Yeah. And it's so exciting too, to read about this. So they're composters, they help divert waste, they turn waste into soil. They will, they're like living fertilizing machines. And they also, in your book, you were saying how they are insecticide. I think you said insecticiders and herbiciders because they're eating the pests that we want to get rid of. They, they, 
they love anything that crawls or moves just about. I mean, they are voracious carnivores, not just a little bit, but a big bit. And so they we actually prefer um, they actually prefer to eat things that wiggle and squirm and and hop and move around. So yeah, uh, for example, in, in my household here, I've got uh, two dogs and too many cats. Well, occasionally, meaning every other day or so, I'll just let my flock free range along the yard and and out in the pasture. And, and I have a little mini um, mini orchard. They will seek and devour ticks and fleas. And of course, so my 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 pets have very few fleas and very, hardly any ticks unless they go off off the property out of zone one, um, zone two, zone one and two. Well, you could even take it so far as to viewing chickens and their carnivore activity as as uh, eating ticks and interrupting Lyme's disease because uh, they, they they will eat ticks, they'll seek them out, and that's one way to uh, keep the tick population way down. And I got to tell you, guineas are even better when it comes to eating ticks, but they're so noisy that they may not be uh, acceptable in urban areas. So the chickens then will turn waste and pests into food for us. So let's get into that aspect of keeping maybe a, a flock of chickens in your yard. What is a good size to start with? And then if you want a certain amount of eggs per week or maybe chicken 101 for those who know nothing about keeping chickens, what's a good way to start? Chicken 101, and uh, we got to start almost with chicken in community 101. I think that the a really good number to allow residents to keep of chickens is eight. And I'll tell you why eight. And they don't have to keep eight. But when you have eight chickens or six, I mean, but preferably eight, uh, what happens is as they age, their egg production drops. But, of course, their skill sets still stay there. It's just they, they produce fewer eggs. It's about a drop of about 20% a year. And you get attached to these little beans. I mean, they are charming. They have personalities. They even have – they're intelligent. Um, it's like it's almost like the family dog or cat. You're, you're not necessarily going to eat it, although you could with these chickens, and many people do. Um, but you don't want to just get rid of it, even though it's not laying eggs. So when you ha- got a number like eight, you can still have um, replacement replacement hens coming in, younger ones coming in as the older ones start to um, get older or even die off. And that's I think that hasn't been a factor across the nation. When the city councils are talking about the number of hens to keep or chickens to keep in a in a family flock, they don't take into account that they they age and they drop in their egg egg number. Um, if someone is just thinking, they're listening, they don't know that much about chickens. Would getting a flock of eight chickens be too much for them? Or how? What advice do you give people who are beginning? Um, and wanting to um, get a few chickens for their for their home. Well, I, I'd probably start out with fewer. If if mm-hmm. I were just getting started in chickens, no fewer than three, because chickens are very social animals. I mean, they they need they need their own company to, to a large extent. So so get at least a minimum of three. Never bring home a single chick from from tractor supply, for example. Um, and, and I would even even say go with with six because chances are one of those six will be a rooster, and you'll have to uh, in the city limits often will have to get a new home for it. So if you if you get if you get say six chickens, let's just go with six for a number right now, or or in any, whatever number of chickens you get, you're going to get after about six months after they start laying, you'll get about one egg every day or every other day. So so if you have, have six chickens, you're going to get about half a dozen to uh, 10, 10 egg, half a dozen to a dozen eggs every week. And how many do you need? I mean, what what's nice though about having extra eggs, and I love, love having extra eggs, I can go to a dinner party and take some eggs from my flock and, and you they would prefer that over a bottle of really fine wine. It's just because they're all different colors. There's the dark chocolate, there's the turquoise, there's the you know some whites and some browns. It's really an eye eye candy kind of a dozen of eggs. So tell our listeners who are let's imagine that they brought their three chickens home. What is the best type of um of house. I read about chicken condos in your book. I read about chicken tractors and all these amazing interior design for chickens. What's a nice basic um, way to house your chickens? That's often the, um, the bottleneck for people getting chickens is what kind of house are we going to do? 
that's what in in city chicks what i wanted to do is to go into the type of furniture that chickens prefer and there's also quite a few different styles of coops there's no one right way to do a coop uh, but they they all have similar features like like for people we all have bathrooms we all have uh, bedrooms there's a kitchen that sort of thing well, well with the chickens it's a similar way they want their roost so they can get up at night preferably be up off the ground um if chickens are are uh, not up off the ground or if they're not uh, in a secure place at night they're they're night blind they cannot see a thing in the dark and that's why they're so vulnerable to not to uh, nighttime predators so they prefer to roost high, and I see some of these coops that are sort of just totally on the ground and with just a kind of a little place for them to get up. I, I don't think that's really – I wouldn't be that happy if I were a chicken just uh, totally on the ground. Um, they, they they need to have a place to eat. Uh, I prefer wall feeders personally, but they're hanging feeders, but, but they'll need a place where they can easily get to food and water, and you can have the water outside or inside. And then they need to be shut up, um, really predator and even, uh, I wouldn't even say um, rodent proof at night so that um, so that they're safe and they need enough room to wander around i mean i think one of the things is is we kind of take a lead from commercial chicken statistics about how much room to give a chicken and and, um, i'm probably guilty of giving mine more than they really need but um, if they don't have enough room they'll get bored they'll start pecking on each other they might start egg eating so having them crowded just like with people can cause problems um, with both health and behavior is it easy to build a coop for your chickens or can you do you buy them at the store or what's the, what do you advise? Well both. If if you have any sort of uh, chicken skills at all, it's pretty easy to to build a coop. Uh for my neighbor for example, they uh they wanted they had a little shed. Uh it was part of a part of a storage area uh almost like a little run-in shed. So we just um took, got a piece of 4 by 8 plywood. Uh, one of the things I like to say about building your coop is lift it up off the ground get it up at least uh, 12 to 18 inches because that will keep any kind of rodent from burrowing underneath and living 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 in tunnels underneath and that will probably take care of just about all the uh, the rodent problems that you have so anyway put it up off the ground at least a little bit and then uh four by eight that was plenty to keep um six to ten chickens And then we just sort of build it up from there in the corner. So two of the walls were already there. And then we just uh, framed it and put uh, hard wire, not chicken wire. Um, I'm not fond, Jill, of using chicken wire on uh, coops because the raccoons can literally pull it off or or rip it. And it rusts pretty fast. So I think either uh, plywood or or, um, hard wire is much better to use. So you can build a basic coop for not that much money, it sounds like. Oh, not at all, uh, and and they don't have to be ugly either. There, uh, you can. A friend of mine, well, for example, the coop that I helped my neighbor build that was just up off the ground in the corner. I think the whole costs in that were it was easily around fifty dollars, maybe not even that. But there are coops that are built um, in architecturally designed. Uh, they have sunrooms. Some are, have little capulas on them. They've got uh, little um, uh, extensions. Uh, co- the external nest boxes are nice with small coops. One of the things to be careful of when you're building these smaller types coops, and I've seen some of them that just do not have enough ventilation. Um, some of them they're like they're almost like coffins. They're so so airtight, and chickens really put off a lot of humidity and a lot of body heat. So unless there um, there's enough ventilation, they can that can cause fungus and respiratory problems. But you want to make sure they're not in a draft. That's the key. They have fresh air, but not in a draft. And for the most most zones, growing zones. I'm in zone six B. Um, even out in Nebraska, there's a book called Open Open Face uh, Chicken Coops. They found that chickens can really do pretty – it depends the breed. I mean, some breeds are for hot weather, some are for cold weather. But if you have cold weather breeds and, and they're – like the Chanticleers, for example, and they're um, – uh, they're kept out of the draft, they'll do just fine in, in uh, very cold temperatures. Would you say chickens are – are they vulnerable to getting sick? Um, do you have to – know a lot about animal health to keep them healthy? I haven't found, well, first off, management. You, you start with good good husbandry, and that's going to take care of most of the health problems. And then, you, then the second thing is, is you get good stock. So 
keeping water clean. My chickens get fresh water every day. And, and I've got it on a little field water in the summers where I can just whisk it out. And, and then the, there's a hose attached to it with a float. So it's not constantly full. They never run out of water. And, and I think if you've got clean water, that goes a long, long way to uh, mitigating a lot of uh, problems. And, of course, the second thing is good food. Don't buy the cheapest food, but give them the most nutritious food. And the third thing is let them out. I mean, let them be able to be in the sunshine and, and chase after bugs and get some exercise and, and scratch and uh, be interested in life. It sounds like good advice for us. Yeah, it's the same for people. I mean, it, don't eat the cheapest food. Eat the most nutritious food you can. And that, that doesn't mean the most nutritious is the most expensive. Uh, one of the books I'm working on, I've got two in progress, but it's Garden Chicks. And it's literally how to, uh, it, uh, it's a matrix that'll be fleshed out about. It's got all the different uh, things you can grow, including perennials, uh, down the side. And then across the top is is when you can let the chickens in to uh, either keep them out or put them in or grow food for them or what the purpose of the plant is. And uh, say, for example, corn, if you want to raise corn for yourself and or for your chickens, there are times when you can't let them in to scratch. Um, they'll, they'll just pull the little seedlings up. But once that corn gets established, it's when it's about knee high. Of course, that's in July, right? When it's about knee high, then you can let a few chickens and you can't really super mob graze it. But family flocks, I define as like 25 or less. So, so you, you can let those those chickens in there. And um the corn is high enough and well established enough that the chickens can't hurt it, but they'll go after the grasshoppers. They'll be scratching and fertilizing the soil and, and mixing mixing whatever the soil is around. And then the corn can provide an overstory for the chickens for protection against sun and, and uh, raptors, the hawks or the the, um, the eagles, what, whatever might be around. So that's just one example of how you can uh, grow plants to um, – provide for your chickens as well as for yourself. Uh, weeping mulberry trees are another example. Chickens love weeping mulberry trees because it forms this little tent-like, and it's really safe inside. And then, of course, they like the mulberries, and I do too. <laughs> so the chickens can actually help in food production, and then they can also eat some of that food themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. All the feed does not have to come from bags, just like all eggs do not come from cartons. What do you think about food? What would you recommend to feed your chickens so they're really healthy? With my chickens, I, I do a hybrid sort of feeding system. I do give them organic feed that I get from uh, Countryside Organics. And it's a, it's a, it's a, not a mash, it's a, a meal. It's, uh, they've got a lot of fine particles in them. It's not, not a pellet. And what I'll do is I'll put water in that to make it or some sort of, uh, some sort of liquid that will make it kind of a, a dough-like enough so the chicken get, get their beak around it and be able to eat, eat it without just wasting a lot of the finer ingredients. So, so they get that every day, but they also have access to a wall feeder that has pellets in it and that's there all the time and i've got uh, uh, two two of the little trough feeders that i put the, the 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 mash in and then one wall feeder so they they can pretty well pick and choose what what they want to eat um the other thing that they do is is they get a lot of people food if i go out to a restaurant or if i'm over to a friend's house or a potluck i'll just put a bucket out saying hey give me all your residues and i'll i'll just take them back to my chickens and then of course i dump it out on that deep mulch system again and they go after it and the dogs go after it and before you know it within an hour or two it's all buried so you can't even see it anyway and it just helps build topsoil and they're also out i mean i do use them as insecticiders they're very good at that um, you can, there's a farmer, um, a CSA farmer here in Virginia. And in the spring, he, he puts his, uh, he has a little layaway or egg mobile or what, whatever you want to call it, a little house on wheels. He'll put the netting around his, uh, brambles and he puts it that way because as the, uh, um, beetles are coming up from, from underneath the chickens will then glean it and they'll, they'll, they'll get them as they're, they're coming up. The larvae as they're coming up, and, and then the fall he does the same thing, and he can get the beetles as they're going down. So he, twice a year he just as are, as, as the, the larvae's coming up or the beetles going down, he lets his chickens take care of uh, take care of them. And the same thing with the plum perculio, for, for example, you can put a, put a, station them as day duty or, or sometime around the uh, around the trees, and and the, as it's cr crawling up the trees, if the chickens see it, they'll they'll eat it. They, they will eat tomato hornworms, but you, you, you've got to pull them off. I haven't really seen them. I, I think they distinguish it from the vine. 
But this is all all the, the anecdotal information that I'm trying to gather for garden chicks. And uh, anyone that has experience, please contact me because I'm just I'm just taking the um, T- taking any information I can, put it in this matrix, and it'll eventually evolve into a book. What's the best way to get a hold of you? And what is the best way that helps you um, if someone wants to buy your book or your books? Oh, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of if you just just go to good, goodearthpublications.com. And um, um, local bookstores can, can get, get any of the books, certainly Amazon, Amazon. Um, uh, it's pretty available through a lot of the hatcheries, so it, it's out there. So, Pat, we have a few more minutes left, and I have a couple more questions. And one thing you just mentioned, um, you have a book of the same name, Chicken Tractors. If you could just give our listeners a definition of that and really um, the benefits of having chicken tractors on your property. Oh, Jill, I'm glad you asked that question because the definition of, of – of chicken tractor has changed. We used to say it was just a bottomless portable cage and you put these chickens in there and then you moved it periodically to, to uh, down the road to create um, um, fertility or you build a raised bed. You just let, you put mulch in it every day and, and build, build up a raised bed where you could plant directly in it. But now is putting the chickens where you want them to work. So it doesn't it doesn't just have to be a bottomless portable cage. It might be assigning them to day duty to to glean up the asparagus patch, say for example, and and um, really mix that mulch in in, in the winter. Um, and uh, or it might be to uh, turn your compost pile, and you 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 throw some scratch in the compost pile. You just let the chickens in there, and then they'll spread it out, uh, spread it out, and aerate it, and clean it for you, and then you can pile it back up. So so. In my mind, anyway, the the term chicken tractor means putting the chickens where they'll do the most good uh, and work the hardest for you. So kind of what we've been talking about through this whole interview is using chickens, a chicken tractor. Right, right. It's putting the chickens where they can work the most for you. Um, and and the, that's and when we first wrote chicken tractor that it was a bottomless portable cage i mean that's what it said on the book but but knowing chickens you know here we are 20 years later almost since the very first edition of that came out it's amazing um gosh i've learned so much about chickens and what they can do that that just to keep them in a in a stationary pen or a, a, a cage is is quite a disservice you're not really using their all their skills and what they can really do so open think outside the coop and let them out and they're easy to contain that's the other thing jill is chickens are really easy to contain they don't run away unless they're chased or get disoriented they'll go back to their coop at night you don't have to herd them back in they they they, they know to go back and even even something as short as a a three-foot um uh, chicken wire around around an area like like a raised bed is enough to keep them out if they've got enough room to go, you know go do other things. So so the the fencing is the key now to using chicken tractors. And sometimes you want to fence the plant in and the chickens out. Sometimes you want to fence the chickens in you know, if you want a certain area where you really want them to work. Uh, other times you just let them free range where, where they just you know go after the bugs and mix up the soil and do do whatever and then other times you'll want to make something like a plant cage for example a comfrey cage where the chickens can glean part of the plant but not hurt the plant not kill it and they can still get that high protein and the benefits of the comfrey so there there are different ways to um, use fencing to get your chickens where you want them to get and if if they're not afraid of you if you've not ever chased them or yelled at them or treated you know They'll come right up to you, and you, you can pretty well easily pick quite a few of them just up. There are some that are always a little wilder than others that you have to either wait tonight to, to, at night to get them. Or, but uh, generally, chickens are pretty pretty docile. Mm, and this brings us to um, one, of, one section of your book is about – um, some of the chickens that have really inspired you and that you've been close to. And I was wondering if you could tell us maybe how that chicken affected you. One of my favorite chickens is Oprah Henfrey. Oprah Henfrey. She's uh, named, her, named her that because of her high people skills. She's incredibly a social, social, uh, social bird. And, and Oprah 
is truly a certified therapy chicken. I can take her into nursing homes or uh, rehab centers, and she will she will r- go in on my arm like a parrot. We just go in, and when we have a chat, I, I talk about chickens and how they can be useful in local agriculture. And then I'll put a towel on, on people's laps, whoever wants to hold her, and just put her there, and they will pet her, and she'll she'll start talking with them. I mean, they, they it's literally a conversation that will go on. I've got so much respect for her. She's just just an amazing, amazingly person of a chicken. That's so cute. I know that was really touching in your, and especially the names that you gave to the hens that you're connected with. Well, the the other big character is Attila the hen. And I'm on the Attila the fourth right now, but the first Attila the hen was a little bantam from the Chesney flea market down in North Carolina. Just, just a little banty hen. She had so much moxie, um, but but she she was also really docile. She'd come up and hop up on your lap. She uh, raised guineas. A little. She sat on guinea eggs and raised the keats. And and she was pretty much uh, undomitable. She was just totally totally a character. And so so when she passed on, of course, I had to have another Attila the hen. And so in my flocks, I'll I'll probably always have a an Oprah Henfrey and an, an Attila the hen. But the originals are are the two really close ones. Pat, if you could share with our listeners. Are, is it legal to have chickens in an urban setting? Depends on the municipality and their codes. But I can say that seven out of the 10 Forbes top cities allow chickens within the, so those cities. So wow. there's not a single, um, as far as I know, there's not a single uh, case where having a family flock next door has affected property values. Not one single documented case. And in fact, in many areas, it's a desirable feature because people are wanting to have local foods. They're wanting to go green and chickens chickens are the way to do it. Okay, that's good to know. And if you wanted to find out if it was legal to have chickens in your community, do you know who you would contact? You would want to contact your, what I would suggest is contact the city uh, legal council and get a copy of the actual code because we've heard uh, time and time again how people have asked are chickens legal they just get a no answer but when they really go look at the code that's on the books it really doesn't say that so go to the source do your own research and then in city chicks there's an entire chapter dedicated on ways and strategies to get chickens legal if they're not and so you just go about changing the code Okay, great. And then um, one part of your book too, Pat, was talking about emergency preparedness and how chickens can really uh, be a valuable asset in that. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I think this is an important thing about local foods as well as emergency preparedness. Uh, Jill, you know, at, at any one time, your local grocery, no matter how big it is, whether it's Walmart or just the local corner store, at any one time, they have at most two to three days of food on their shelves. That's it. Two to three days. So if the supply lines get broken, say say across the Mississippi River or, or a storm comes or whatever happens that disrupts supply lines, that you, and you don't have much of a pantry, it's not going to be there for you. And I know some of these center cities you see that where they'll pan the the shelves are so empty as the storm is coming on. So, but here's what's true for me anyway. And part of part of what I what what I do is I view my family flock as part of my emergency preparedness because the electricity can go out, the heat can go out. I mean, I've got a wood stove, which is nice, but but the the, the stores can be completely empty and I'll still be getting eggs. And if things really get bad, of course, I can have a chicken dinner. And if they really, really get bad, um, that organic feed would probably make a pretty good musla. So I could certainly, I think, get by <laughs> for for a couple months even. Um, with, with my family flock and the feed feed that I usually keep. And there's even cases where in Dominican Republic, for example, they have a national policy of encouraging feral chickens, feral chickens uh, in, in on the island, so that even they say the poorest of the poor can go into the bush and get some eggs or at least have a chicken dinner. So it, it's part of their... Uh, um, their network. So, so yeah, it can be a part of, of emergency preparedness, but it's also can be part of a national um, defense system and security system. The, the, the defense department has repeatedly come out saying that the America's weakest links in, in our, in our um, security system, it's not necessarily 
planes going into buildings or, or people blowing up things. Our weakest links are our water and our food supplies. That's our weakest links. And, you know, there's an ancient chicken proverb that says, whoever controls your food controls you, right? I mean, that's That's been used as a military strategy for, for you know, since time began. So if you've got a strong community food supply or a strong local food supply, and um, the water gets contaminated or the food supply gets contaminated with whatever, um, you, you'll probably be okay. You, you'll still be able to eat uh, from your local foods. So chickens really can offer us some a bit of insurance. In my belief system, they absolutely can. I mean, the, the Roman soldiers traveled with chickens. They had the a breed called the Dorking that they would travel with, and that would be for eggs. The famous General Robert E. Lee, for example, he had a chicken that uh, a hen that slept under his cot at night, and she gave the general an egg for his breakfast just about every morning. I, you are you are an encyclopedia of chicken facts. I don't know about that, <laughs> but <laughs> but I think it's pretty interesting that 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 humans have evolved with chickens, dogs, and cats. I mean, we we've, we've co-evolved for. At least, uh, oh gosh, I forget if it's three or ten thousand years. It's a, it's a very very long time, and, and chickens, of course, came to be around humans because we offered protection from predators and that sort of thing, and then then um, we we would eat the chickens and their eggs. So it was a mutually beneficial, uh, synergistic coexistence that has evolved and and it was only in the last 50 years since just after world war ii that all the chickens disappeared from backyards and went into factory farms so we're we're, we're just about two to three generations away from having any kind of animal husbandry or knowledge about having you know livestock like chickens in our in our in our environment and the other nice thing about chickens, Jill, is is once people get chickens, there's a saying that goes, uh, the chickens are the gateway to other livestock. So once you get chickens, then you start thinking about bunnies and maybe little miniature goats and, you know, so um, all and all that uh, I think can help support local foods as well as an awareness of healthy food, really, really healthy food, living soils and uh, maintaining uh, the health of the nation. Lastly, Pat, is there anything that I may not have known enough about chickens to ask you um, about chickens or anything else you want to share with our listeners today? Well, I know there's a big hesitation sometimes because people want to get it just right, but I would say just jump in and the chickens will teach you. Just go ahead and get a few. They're, they're remarkably forgiving. And of course, as we stay on the uh, Chicken Whisperer talk show at the end, uh, as we close, we say, may the flock be with you. And we're getting getting back more and more now. People are saying, and with you. So. <laughs> I know the flock is with you. Many the flock is with me, and I'm very <laughs> blessed. Thank you. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com sustainableworldradio.com Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier Music by Dana Lyons Thanks for listening